Hi, I'm Pastor Don Cherry of the Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stevens City, Virginia. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for our worship service. We're hoping that it'll be a blessing to you, be an encouragement to you, and even a little bit of a challenge to you as we look into the Word of God together. So I hope that you'll follow us, have your Bible out, and all join in with us and join us as we go into the Word of God this morning. May it be a blessing to you. You know what I like about a song like that is no matter what you're going through, God's always there. God's always there. He's always somebody you can go to. You never think that you're going through something alone, that you're experiencing something by yourself. No, God is always there. You know, we need to remember that's the kind of God we have, a God that never leaves, a God that never forsakes, but a God that is always there, is willing to hear the prayers of his people and to walk with us through whatever we may go and be going through. I'd like for you to take your Bibles this morning, go to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> this is the um, final message of this series that we've looked at, uh, The Believer's Hope from Rapture to Millennium. Now, we looked, um, looked at the millennial last week. We would think, well, there's the place that we jump off of. But there's one other event that I wanted to bring out that we are not going to be participating in, but yet I think we see. I think we view it. I think we're going to be very much aware of this event that we're going to read, be reading about today in Revelation chapter 20. If you look at uh, Revelation chapter, um, let me get there. I was in my other text. If you all will hang on just a second. There we go. We're going to pick it up there in verse 11, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Now, I want you to understand this as we go through here, okay? This is referring to those without Jesus Christ, okay, because Believers are never referred to as the dead, okay? Because our hope is we'll be raised again one day, and we will live one day eternally with Christ. So this is, I just want you to understand who this is being addressed to. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now pay attention here. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for this time of assembly, and we thank you for your word. Lord, help us to grasp what you are relaying to us this morning. Help us to see clearly. Lord, we're so thankful for Christ. We're so thankful for the shed blood. We're so thankful for your grace. It just abounds, Lord. And all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we see that there were those who are not going to be at that particular place. But there is another fate awaiting them. And Lord, I pray that we'll be able to just dissect it and define it in a way that burdens our hearts for those outside of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We love you today in his precious name. Amen. I mentioned to you that um, I'm a Law and Order fan, okay? I like the older episodes primarily, but um, don't always agree with the content, you know, the context of it and such, but I like to watch the process. You know, you're, you're introduced at first to the crime, and then you see the gathering of the evidence, okay? All that goes through the evidence, then that evidence is presented in a courtroom situation, and, all, and after the evidence is presented, a jury makes a decision about based on what the evidence was, was portrayed. And um, by and large, most of the time, uh, the guilty person is found guilty 
okay? But uh, sometimes they get off, regardless of what it may be. But nonetheless, I kind of like that courtroom scene. So um, I want you to kind of place yourself right now in a courtroom scene, okay? Has anybody here ever been to court? No? Okay. Um, I hope for not bad things. But anyway, um, <clears throat> been to court. Um, I remember one time I served on a jury and went through this whole thing. You know, everything. We listened to the evidence that was uh, presented. We had to go back. We had to weigh the evidence. We had to draw it out. We had to make the decision. And then we came back and presented, you know, the verdict. So this would give you some idea of what's going on here and and some specifics of the setting. And I'm going to use a who, what, when, where, and why. Okay. So it might be easy for you to take some notes if you like to do that. So let's start off with the who, if we could. Who. Who is there? Who is at the setting? For one, there's the righteous judge. There's the righteous judge. That is the king of the universe. That is Christ. That is God who's going to be on this great white throne, okay? He is the judge. He is the righteous judge, and he will rule, the Bible tells us, in righteousness. All of his decisions, there won't be an appeal. There won't be any glitches and everything. There won't be any misconduct whatsoever and everything. He will rule based on truth and righteousness. So there is no recourse for the verdict that is given. Then the host of heaven, I believe, will be there. And here's why I believe that we will see. Because as you go further into Revelation and all, you see where God wipes away all the tears from our eyes. I think we're going to know what happens here. I think we're going to see, and I think it's going to break our hearts in in many ways because of maybe someone we know that is standing there or someone we know that we failed to tell. And and that's going to be burdensome upon us. But God one day is going to wipe all that away, okay? There will be no tears, no sorrow. Now, that's just what I feel. Take it or leave what, what you want, okay? But that's where I see it coming from. So the host of heaven are there. Then also the accused are there. Notice it said the dead, small and great, are going to stand before God. The books are going to be open, and they're going to be judged out of those books. You know, some of us are good bookkeepers, right, Barbara? Some of us are good bookkeepers. Some of us can't remember anything unless we write it down. You know, Paul, okay, that works for you, okay? But nonetheless, God, we need to understand, keeps immaculate books, immaculate books. You know, there's going to be things even there that he's got written down that we probably don't remember. But he's got it written down, you see. And that's what's going to be open. And the Bible says they're going to be judged out of those things. Now what? What's the what on this? Well, it says a great white throne. The great white throne judgment or the final judgment that we see in Scripture. There have been others. The Bible talks about a judgment of nations. And there are those nations that will be judged as to their treatment of Israel. Okay? Their treatment of Israel. I hope that we will continue to practice to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6. You know, Israel, God's chosen people, folks. And I think we need to remember that. And I think that um, uh, to pray for them and everything to uphold them and such because they are the apple of his eye indeed. So the nations will be judged <clears throat> according to their treatment of Israel. Believers, we already looked at that, the judgment seat of Christ where we all must appear and all we all must give an account. And, all, and salvation, keep in mind, salvation is not, is not the issue. Salvation is not the subject, but rather our life, our works will be weighed, okay? And that is based on what the rewards and all. If our works that uh, uh, honor and glory Jesus Christ you know, outweigh, then there are rewards. But if it goes the other way, then we lose rewards, but salvation is not the issue. The fact that we are saved and everything, we stand before that, you see. So that is the uh, judgment seat of Christ, and then... There's the judgment of the lost, which we are looking at today. So when is this judgment going to take place? Well, we see a couple of things in Scripture. One, it's going to take place after the millennial reign. The millennial reign came to a close, um, um, has already come to a close. Okay, that's already been taken. The thousand years is over, and at the end of that thousand years, and all is when this is going to take place. Also, it will take place after the final rebellion. Now, what am I talking about on that? Well, again, if you go into Scripture, you'll see at the end of the thousand years that Satan, who has been bound in the bottomless pit with all of his demons and such, has been bound there for a thousand years. But at the end of that thousand years, he's going to be loosed. And he is going to go throughout this world. And he's going to gather himself basically a following to make one final overthrow, attempted overthrow 
of Jesus Christ and the throne of God. Now, here's what really baffles me. So I want you to place yourself in this situation. You're an Old Testament Jew, okay? I'll just put it that way. Eric's a New Testament Jew. But anyway, you're an Old Testament Jew. And you're there, you've just gotten out of Egypt, and you're in the Red Sea, okay? And all of a sudden, you see that sea part. You see the water roll up. The ground dries out, and you're able to cross there. Now, I mean, to me, it'd be a little scary, okay? You're walking through. I don't know how high that water is, but, you know, you're doing one of these. But nonetheless, God said, so you go, right? Now, I don't know about you, but if I was standing there and I watched that sea part and I watched the dry land, I think I'd believe in God, you know? And it wouldn't be a hard sell for me. I don't know about you, but it wouldn't be a hard sell for me. Well, here's what j j just mystifies me. There are going to be people on this earth who are going to personally experience Jesus Christ. He's going to rule and reign, right? <clears throat> okay, from the throne of his father David. He's going to be physically here on the earth. He's going to rule and reign. People are going to see him. They're going to talk to him. They're going to see his work, all that stuff. They're going to view him specifically. And yet, when Satan is loosed, He's going to gather from those that have viewed Christ for all that time and trick them into following him and overthrow Jesus Christ. I, I, don't, I don't get that. I don't understand how it happened. But that shows you the power of Satan. And folks, listen to me, Christian, brothers and sisters of Christ and all. If we think, if we think that Satan can't affect us, he's got you. He's got you already. Because there's not a one of us in here that's not vulnerable to his tactics, okay? He's a deceiver. He's deceptive. But you want to keep in mind, he was also the wisest of all creation, of all created beings. And here's the thing. He knows what buttons to push. You get that this morning? That's why the Bible tells us and everything. We've got to daily be aware of that. We can't just sit back and say, hey, man, things are going great. Satan must be leaving me alone. He is setting you up for a fall, honey. You better be ready, you see. You better stay on top of this thing. So that final rebellion is going to take place after the millennial reign, after that final rebellion. And this may not be a popular saying because we, we, we don't like to think about this thing. But do you understand that you and I and Satan have something in common? Well, we don't like that, do we? What do you mean I got something in common with Satan? I don't want anything in common with Satan. What are you talking about? What do I have in common with Satan? The desire to be God. The desire to be in control. That's the same thing with Satan wanted to be God, didn't he? Right? Isn't that what he said? I will assert my throne above, above that of God. I will be like God and all that good stuff. I'm going to be like that. You know what? We're no different. We want to be in control. We want to call the shots. We want our will to be done. We want things done our way. Just the way it is, you see. But that's the way we want it. And you know what? That's what we have in common with Satan, folks. Such, Because that's exactly what he wanted to do. It's what I call the Judges Syndrome. You remember the Judge, book of Judges? What was, the, what, what was the main thing there? Somebody knows it. Who, what is it? There is no king in Israel, and every man did that which right in his own eyes. See, what we've done, okay, so we're not Old Testament Jews, but what we've done, we've removed God from the throne, and we put ourselves there, you see, doing the same thing today, doing the same thing today. And each of us have to give account of that, folks. We have to give account of that. So we got the who, we got the what, we've got the when. Now where? Well, the Bible doesn't say. It just says there is a great white throne. You know, where the Bible is silent, then we need to let it remain silent. Uh, for one, I don't think it's in heaven as far as the abode of God goes because God's, God's presence can't be touched by sin. Maybe it's out there in the celestial heaven. I don't know. You know, the Bible doesn't say, so I'm not even going to conjure and such. But it is going to be a location. It is going to be specific. It is going to be a place where the dead will stand before God at this great white throne. And then why? 
Well, the Bible tells us here that they're going to be judged out of the books according to their works, okay? So everything that they have done, everything is going to be made known, and there's going to be no appeal. There's going to be no, no saying, I didn't say that. It's going to be right there. God's got it written down. But the reason they are there, the one reason that they are there, I want you to get this, is the cost of rejection. Talk about what have they rejected. They rejected the love of God. They rejected the blood of Christ. And they rejected the gift of the indwelling spirit. They rejected Christ. You see, they're not going to be able to say, but God, you don't understand. I gave all this money to these charities and everything, and I helped build libraries, and I helped build schools, and I helped my neighbor out when they were in problem, and they're going to tell you all these things and everything that they did and everything, but yet it's going to come out and everything they rejected Christ. And there's going to be no recourse on that. There's even going to be those, I think, that have sat in churches for years and decades. But you don't understand. I was in church. I sang in the choir. I taught a Sunday school class. The books are going to be open. And the rejection of Christ is going to be revealed. You see, there's going to be no recourse. There's going to be no recourse. The verdict's going to come down guilty. Guilty. In our court system here in the U.S., we can appeal till the cows come home. But there's no appeal in the court of heaven because the evidence is 100% fact and can't be manipulated. One thing I found myself guilty of, and I, I try not to, and oftentimes the Lord slaps me upside the head, is when I see people in the world today, the way they act, the way they dress, the way they behave, you know, and, and I'll admit I keep up on political things, and also I, I, I kind of come from that uh, from that demographic. But I think, and, and, and the Lord, Lord helps, helps with this, I think one thing that the church has been guilty of, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the church as a scope, that the church has been guilty of is that we expect lost people to act like saved people. We do. We expect them to look like us, talk like us, dress like us, such like that. And folks, we're talking about two different natures, okay? We're talking about one, a heavenly nature in Christ, and another just a worldly nature. That'd be like, I don't know, that, that, that'd be like expecting, you know, I don't know, expecting an elephant to swim like a dolphin. Well, they can't do that. They're two different creatures, everything. Two different natures in that, you see? That can't happen. And this is what, I go back to Matthew chapter 9 and all where Jesus was looking on the multitude and he said that he, that he had compassion on them. He knew what they were going through. He understood what they were dealing with. And he saw them through that lens and then he saw them as people, just sheep having no shepherd. Again, church, this is, this is a message to us. How do we see the loss today? You know, maybe we think there are some of those, uh, you know what, they deserve hell. Adolf Hitler deserves hell. Joe Stalin deserves hell. You know, uh, Pol Pot deserves hell. Ceausescu deserves hell. All the, you know, pick out a name. Man, these people deserve hell. But oftentimes we think that if they don't look like me and act like me and talk like me and everything, they deserve hell. And here's the bottom line and everything. Every one of us deserves hell. Do we understand that? Every one of us deserves hell. And it's only by the grace of God that we're not going to experience that. You see, only by the grace of God. I hope that we can look at people as Jesus did. Look at them with compassion. Look at them as sheep, no, as having no shepherd. And then we're going to look at for momentarily the final incarceration. I'm going to use a different scripture, but you'll understand where I'm going to. Go to Luke chapter 16, if you would, in your Bibles. Luke chapter 16.
If you have a Bible like mine, it's on page 91. If you don't, then it ain't going to work. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture to you, but let's read it. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. There's a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now notice these first three words, and in hell. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. He sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cries and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now catch this, for I am tormented in this flame. Did you get the gist of that? Now this is talking about hell. In the Old and New Testament, there's two words used for that, Sheol and Hades. It talks about the place of the departed. Those that departed, departed from God, no longer in his presence. And then when we get over the Revelation and read of the lake of fire, it's called Gehenna. Gehenna is a word used from the valley of Hinnom, which is out the southern gate of the city of Jerusalem. It was basically the landfill. And that is where people of the city would constantly take the trash and all constantly take it and just dump it out in this landfill and they would burn it and basically the, in doing so, the fire would never go out because it was continually being fueled with trash. It was the Valley of Gehenna, which is what we get the lake of fire from, a place where the fire never goes out, you see. Now, the Bible's not telling us that rich people die and go to hell and poor people die and go to heaven. That's not the point of it, okay? We see two different individuals in this story. But the common thing that we see is that they died. The poor man, who obviously was a man of faith, was carried off into a good place. But the rich man who trusted in his riches, trusted in the things that he had, trusted in the things that he did, the Bible says he went to a not-too-nice place, you see. There's three things about this final incarceration we need to understand. First of all, it's a literal place. This is not a place of allegory. This is not a place of mythology. This is a literal place, okay? The Bible speaks of that, and we see it right before us. Secondly, it's a literal torment. A literal torment, literal flames, and man still has his faculties and all. It's not once you hit the flames, you die. But notice this man had his faculties, he had his sight, he had his hearing, he had his feeling, he had all those things. Even though the Bible calls it the second death, it's basically referring you die eternally. You die eternally. And then it's a literal finality, meaning it never ends. It never ends. Oh, I think I can endure it for just 100 years. Yeah, maybe 1,000 years and then it'll be over. No, it never ends. My father-in-law dealt with chronic pain most all of his life, at least in the years that I knew him and such. Osteoporosis. All arthritis, he had um, three back surgeries and everything. I think two or three knee surgeries, an artificial joint and everything. He just dealt with pain, you know, most all his life. I remember having a conversation about it one time. And, and I'll be honest with you, okay, I'm a wimp when it comes to pain, okay. I don't like to hurt. If, they, if I slam my thumb with a hammer and everything, it's a hospital trip. Man, I just, I don't do pain well at all. Maybe not that bad. But we were talking about this one time, 
And I remember dad saying, he, he said, the pain's not real bad. It's not like bad pain. You know, we've all had bad pain. Maybe we've had migraines or something like that. I mean, that's pain, such. He said, it's not that it's excruciating pain. He says, it's just the knowledge that it will never go away. It'll never go away. And that's what eats on you. That's what just, you know, tears you, tears you up. Knowing that there's not anything that would be done to make this go away, that I'm going to have it all my life. And I believe that is the torment of hell. Yes, there's literal flames. There's a literal torment and everything, but also there's going to be the knowledge that this is never going to end. And let me tell you something. If you're a child of God this morning, we need to praise him for his wonderful gift. If you're not a child of God this morning, I want you to understand we've defined where your eternity is at. But every one of us knows somebody who's not a child of God, don't we? You know a brother or sister. You know a friend. You know a neighbor. You know a coworker. And this is how we need to see. Now, if you notice the rich man there in Luke, if you go on in that pa passage and everything, he wanted Abraham, he wanted, send somebody to my brothers. Let them know, I don't want them coming to this place. Don't want them coming here. We think how kind. But for the rich man in hell, it was too late. You and I, it's not too late. We can still tell somebody, can't we? We can still let somebody know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the only way we're ever going to get that message across is when we start seeing people with the compassion of Christ and see them as sheep having no shepherd. We don't judge people by the color of their hair or their skin. We don't judge people by what parts of their bodies are pierced or drawn on. We don't judge people by how they dress. We see them as created in the image of God because that's how they are, created in the image of God. Would you buy Folks, thanks for joining us in our live stream here from Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And I trust that the message was an encouragement to your heart today. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry or, you know, if there's something we can pray for you about or a spiritual question that we can answer, I want to encourage you to go to our website at svbcfamily.com. That's for Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church Family. Dot com and just follow the prompts there and you can send your prayer request you can send your question and everything we'll get back to you as soon as possible but as always you're welcome to join us any sunday at 10 30 a.m right here in uh, stephen city located right between route 11 and i-81 so uh, come and see us sometime but until then i pray the lord bless you i pray the lord keep you and that the lord shine his face upon you